welcome to the Margaret Carey Q&A. And uh, introducing Margaret Carey, I mean, here she is, guys. So, here's what we're going to do. Go ahead and get comfortable. Okay, I'm comfortable. Okay, awesome. Standing? Are you sure? Sure. Okay. I'm going to stand too then. Uh, so, you guys, this There's is no fun behind the table, sitting there <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out who you are and where you're calling me from. We're going to have fun. We are going to have fun. All right. This is very exciting for me. That, she made up her mind that I was going to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to have fun. Um, so, you guys, this is a Q&A. So, um, just like you're in school, if you have a question, we ask you to just raise your hands and uh, kind of keep it to one question at, at a time. You can always raise your hand again and we can come back around to you. And, um, you know, with that, I, it's like a minute early, but we can go ahead and, and get started. I get to ask them a question, too. You can do whatever you like. Hey, my question is, do any of you have any idea who I am? <laughs> well, you know, my son has this wonderful line that he says, Mom, you're famous, just nobody knows it. <laughs> so, you Very know, I, I think I better ask. Well, that's awesome. So, if you have a question, just... Okay, let me ask you a All question right. and we'll get it started. When, uh, did anybody see the movie Peter Pan? The Disney movie? The real one. <laughs> The good one. <laughs> okay, we're, we're in good shape there. Uh, I want to ask you a question about Peter Pan himself, the character. Now, I did a movie at RKO just before I did the uh, work at Disney Studios, and my brother in the movie was Bobby Driscoll. And Bobby Driscoll, I don't know if you know it, did you know that he won? and a Junior Academy Award for his acting. He took home a, an Oscar. So the strangest part to me was, in the whole movie, he was the only one who did not speak with an English accent. Did anybody ever notice that? Oh, yeah. I thought that was really hard. <laughs> I did not notice that. Oh, well, you see, you have, you have to go back and look at the movie. But he could have done it. He was just fabulous at what he did. But the idea that everyone else you see was speaking with this beautiful English accent and everything was going well, including Catherine Beaumont and all the ones that went with it. And here he was talking, hey, Tink, get over here. You know? <laughs> I, I always thought that was very odd. But then I guess nobody but me noticed it. <laughs> yes? No? Did any of you? Wow. Not that you mentioned it. I must be brilliant. <laughs> Don't you think? Okay. I think so. Okay. So, any of, no, does that bring up a question? Yes. Basically, how did you fall into this? How did you, how did it happen that you became Tinkerbell or got the Now, I'm, I'm 90 years old. Right. <laughs> so, I am. So, Sarah's going to repeat questions because I don't listen good. <laughs> Tell me your question again. Oh, I just want to know how she how she fell into the part. Like like how did that? How did you fall into the part oh, of that's Tinker what Bell? Did. Okay. Um, I was born in 1929, and I caused a depression. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but everything went right downhill from there, <laughs> and it really did for me because I lost my family. And I was adopted by two people who were old enough to be my grandparents, darling people. And at four years of age, they looked at me and said, my, isn't she cute? Let's put her to work. <laughs> I have been working 86 years in the business and loving it all the time. So I started in Midsummer Night's Dream. I'm getting to your answer. I really am. Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, I was a fairy when I was four years old, and then I went into our game comedies. I did about eight of those, and then I was in National Velvet and all these other. Well, by that time, I had an agent. You better have an agent by that time. And so the agent called me up. I was at 20th Century Fox, <clears throat> and I was assistant dance director there, 
and they, my agent called up and said, can you get out of work tomorrow? And they're interviewing for a, a three and a half inch Sprite who doesn't talk. And they need, a, you know, she didn't say body model or anything because nobody knew that that's what they were doing then. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Disney had kept it quiet. They really have. So I said, well, you know, okay. Uh, I can do. She said, "It's a Disney. Disney. I will be there. I will be there." I mean, that's the way everybody felt. If you could get to Disney, so that night I did a. You remember 45 records with the big holes in the middle? I put choreographed a pantomime of an 11-year-old boy making breakfast. You know, things like juggling eggs and dropping them and scratching and so on and so forth. And I, the next morning, I took my little player over with my D record. And sure enough, I went through the, the archway that said Disney Studios, the little one, not the one that they have now. And I said, the man found my name on the clipboard. I mean, I was excited. I was really, really excited. So I went in and he told me where to park and where to go. And of course, I was looking for a rehearsal studio. And I got sent to this silly building called an animation building that looked like, I don't know, an office building. And I immediately got lost. <laughs> I was really good at things like that. And along came this tall, lanky guy who said, uh, you look lost. That's Disney Studios. They will stop and look after you. They really will. It's the second happiest place on earth to work at Disney Studios. I'll tell you that right now. So anyway, um, he said, oh, uh, I'm going to see Mark Davis, who is, uh, I don't know, uh, I'll take you. So we were chatting. We went up to the third floor, and we marched down. He says, there's his office right there. And, and he says, say, tell him to say hello from Ollie. It was one of the top animators in the, in the business who took me there because he didn't want me to get lost. Does that give you a feeling of, of it's still like that today? So I went in and I introduced myself and he, Mark Davis, a gentleman, a dear man. I dedicated my book to Mark Davis and I get to go next Sunday to the Walt Disney Museum and talk about Mark Davis and Tinkerbell. I'm so excited about that too. Anyway, back. So I walk in and he says, what's that? And I said, that's a, 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 a record player. He says, I know. I said, I'm going to do this pantomime for you because I know I just don't walk in and say, hi, here I am, hire me, you know, kind of thing. I've been a dancer since I'm four years of age, so I knew how to do all of that and uh, taught dancing sometimes. And he said, wait a minute. So he got Jerry Geronimi to come down, who was an Uber director that, of the whole picture. And they looked at me and I saw it. So they said, well, let's see this. And <laughs> they couldn't find a plug. <laughs> and here's again Disney. These two guys got down on their hands and knees and found a plug to plug this in. You wouldn't find that at Warner Brothers. <laughs> other Warner Brothers is sort of like, well, if you behave yourself, we'll let you stay for half a day. You know? But it wasn't that. So I did my, my pantomime of the kid. And they liked it. And so they asked me to do this, the, the scene that you may remember. Do you remember in the nursery when Tinkerbell found the mirror? And she landed on it. Well, here's what I did. They said, here's a mirror over here, Margaret. And we want her to land on the mirror and look at herself and then get upset about her hips. And I said, sure, I can do that. I'm going to hand this to Sarah. This is what it looked like. This is the way I did it.
So they said, would it be convenient for you to come to work next Tuesday? Oh. I finally got around to your answer. <laughs> And I did, and I worked there for nine months, off and on. It wasn't the kind of thing that you went in every day, because I was doing uh, ABC Network um, family show with Charlie Ruggles. I played the daughter for, uh, I think it was six seasons. And then I had my own television show on Channel 13 at the same time. I was also doing radio. That's what you did then. So they would call me up when they were ready for the next one, and so there I would come. And uh, I had the best time. And the last time that I saw Bobby Driscoll, I was going up to the commissary because I wanted a chocolate sundae. That's what I wanted. And everything had closed down. I had done a good job. I knew that day. And I go up, and I see this streak of green coming up on this side. And here was Bobby Driscoll in his costume with his green tights, which he hated to wear, and his, his hat. And he said, you, you don't think they're closed, do you? And I said, I don't know. And so we stood there, and I let him beg the manager to open up <laughs> the commissary because they had closed. And I figure, who would say no to a kid in green tights? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in we go. And of course, all the cash registers were closed, so we got everything free. And as we're walking out, he's got his ice cream, I've got my ice cream, and suddenly I thought, ice cream on this beautiful uh, Robin um, uh, Peter Pan costume. So I went back and I got some napkins and I stuck them around my eyes. And I was your sister on the last movie that we made, and now I'm still looking after you. He says, Oh, is that who you are? And we stood there and chatted and ate our ice cream, and that was the last time that I saw Bobby. But that was the kind of thing that we did there. Uh, it, it, was, it was magic. I live about four miles away from the studio, and then on the other side, I live about two miles away from Imagineering. So that's where I am. I hardly ever get to Disneyland. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that. And so, I've given you all kinds of information. You should have whole kinds of questions now. <laughs> yes? So I'm an aspiring animator. What was it like working with the animators or the concept artists at the time? Uh, she wanted to know what it was like working with the animators at the time. Well, I have to tell you, I don't know. You don't know? I well, I will tell you why. Because how they did was they called, and we had the great big huge sound stage, sound stage one, and they would call me over and I would be in my bathing suit because they never made a costume for me, but they did my hair up and I would go in. And who is sitting there but Mark Davis? And he had the storyboards of what he wanted and, and sketches that were going. I, I, I digress for a minute. About 60 years later, I was called in to do a salute to Mark Davis. Uh, Andreas Deja was doing and I'm sitting in his house, and they're photographing it, and I'm telling about all my stories and all the wonderfulness. And they bring out, Andreas had five of the original Mark Davis sketches oh, wow. that I saw up on the walls the first time that I met him, and they put them in my lap. I will tell you, now anybody who knows me, I have never really been speechless. That time I came close. <laughs> it was just fabulous to look down and see because Tinkerbell's very, very difficult to draw. She's extreme and she only, by the way, you should know this, uh, Mark always put nine, uh, seven points to her skirt. Never more than that and never less. So you know who the real ones are kind of thing. <clears throat> and it, it was it was a moment that I, I could relive what was, but I just worked with Mark and Jerry Geronimi, who was the overall director on it, and it, that was enough. <laughs> now, I also produced uh, animation myself, and through that, uh, I produced a, a piece of animation for the state of California, um, oh, years later. You know, I was about 
50, I guess, something like that, years later, and it was uh, called a quake, don't let it shake you. And it was about earthquake convention, um, prevention, and <clears throat> no, you can't prevent an earthquake. <laughs> uh, what am I trying to say? What's that word I want? Um, awareness. Prep. Prep. Uh, you know what you should, anyway, I did good. <laughs> And I'm, I'm walking uh, down, uh, CBS called me up and they said they wanted me to do a, um, a Sunday, one of those talk shows, you know, to talk about. Well, I wrote the script and everything because I figured I'd been through an earthquake. I, I sort of knew what was going on. And what does the state of California know? They went, okay. So anyway, we, we showed some of it. I went out in the hall. This is personal. I went out into the hall. <clears throat> to say goodbye to the producer who had invited me. And this lady came by and she said, oh, Connie, I found my birth mother and went on. And I said to Connie, well, what was that all about? She said, well, there was a lady here, you talk about serendipity, there was a lady here a couple of weeks ago who's helping people find their birth mother. I said, well, I was adopted. I've never found my birth mother. She said, here, take this number. I found my whole family in that particular oh, day. Great. So that's what animation has done for me and other things. And as I came here two weeks ago, I found another about 40 people from my family from down south. So I'm terribly excited about it. We came, when, I'll tell you a story about it. I'll tell you a story. I, I am an entertainer. Did you notice that? <laughs> okay, I'm an entertainer, and for a year, I tap dance still. I'm 90, and I get up on the stage on the, on the Andy Griffith uh, shows that we do for May Berry and so on. And uh, so I, I, I told this story for the longest time, and I didn't know why I loved it, because I didn't know what my fam who my family was. These lovely people who took care of me, I, I understood that. And this is the story that I told. I speak 21 different dialects and have about 48 different voices and I've done over 600 cartoons in my life and you still hear them uh, on, on the YouTube and all the rest. But here's the story and I'll tell you why I get excited about this one. And I may entertain you at the same time. Who knows? <laughs> that would be nice. <clears throat> and I used to tell this from the stage. And this is over a pub over in Ireland. And, and everybody's having a grand time. They're talking about diversity, you know, whether they like the idea of diversity or not. And one of them say, well, I wouldn't like a bunch of Italians running around here. And the other one says, yeah, you bet, because all the girls would go to the Italian. You think so? And they said, oh, yes. They said, well, let's go ask Paddy what he thinks. So they go over to where Paddy is, and he's knocking them back pretty good, you know. And they said, Paddy. He says, what is it? He says, what would you be if you weren't Irish? Paddy says, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> so when I found my family, guess what? I'm Irish. <laughs> and I have Scots in me, you know, I put that together. So uh, it's been an exciting life. Uh, as I say, I've been at it 86 years. I do have a book. I would love it, if I may, if you'd pull out your phones, and I will give you a special bonus for the book, if you like. Yeah. Pull it out, and you can check in to TinkerbellTalks.com. Mm -hmm. TinkerbellTalks.com. And there will be a button there that says if you want to buy the book. And it's a brilliant book. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> it really is. It, and uh, so it says, you push the button that says, unsigned book. OK. But that's $29.95. If you put in the word, wow, W-O-W, -W, you get a signed book and a 5 by 7 signed photograph from me because of, of being here. And I ran out of books. So, um, my book is a little different because it's entertaining. <laughs> it is. It honestly is. There are 80 chapters, the, the, and 160, some very rare pictures in it. And the trick is that 
None of them are over eight pages, and every chapter has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you can read that one chapter and put it down and have a good time, and most of them are funny. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see, what else is brilliant about me? Um, bah, 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 bah. Okay, I'll stop now. Have any questions? Yes? What is your favorite Mark Davis story? What is your favorite Mark Davis story? What is my favorite Mark Davis story? Oh, well, I'm sitting there <clears throat> at Club 33. It has to do with me, so I can tell you. Um, <laughs> we're, we're sitting there at Club 33 about, I guess, 30 years when the movie had been premiered. And uh, I'm my usual self, Tinkerbell self, and you know, having a good time. And Alice is sitting next to us. You know about his wife? that she is, was, is, I should say, um, designed all the costumes for Pirates of the Caribbean. She, uh, she designed so many for It's a Small World. Brilliant, brilliant artist on her own. Just a delightful lady. Anyway, she's sitting there, and Mark is sitting there, and we're at Club 33, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, I say something very hilarious, of course. <laughs> and Mark leans over and says to me, Margaret, you are still Tinkerbell. Aww. Yeah. And I said, Mark, I think that's the nicest thing that you've ever said to me, except maybe, would it be convenient to come to work next Tuesday? <laughs> and he grinned. And every time that we, I will tell you, um, something that, that Mark Davis is very interesting to me about him. When um, I got the okay to go over to Disney Archives and pick out dozens of photographs that are in the book that I could just get them and, and use them and give, uh, have a Disney okay in them, you could hardly find a picture of Mark Davis. If you found a group of the 90 men, he was usually in the back peeking over somebody's shoulder. And you will see over and over and over again that they use practically the same picture for him wherever they t are saying, uh, talking about him. And the museum had a great deal of problems trying to, he never put himself forward. He never was in front. He was a gentle man. He, uh, and he protected me. And he protected Catherine, um, Beaumont also, I talked to Catherine one time, and I said, you know it could get really rough and ready at a studio. I mean, I'm standing there looking pretty darn cute in a one-piece bathing suit, romping around like Tinkerbell, <coughs> and never one word from the crew, he wouldn't put up with it. And I said to Catherine, did you feel this? She said, I always felt protected. And that was Mark Davis. He was just a dear, dear man, and brilliant beyond belief. I said to him one time when he said, now we want her to look very grumpy. Well, that can mean anything, right? So I said, how grumpy do you want her to be? He took a sheet of paper, turned it around, and with a pencil, I would say 25 seconds to 30 seconds, he turned it around, and there was Tinkerbell's face, just how he wanted it. I thought, this man is a genius, and he, he was, and he was just a doll. And poor Alice kept saying, you know, get out there, get in front, uh, uh, you know, and he never would. He was a very quiet man and easy, easy to work with, great director. I have a question. How, yes. how old were you when you auditioned for Tinkerbell? Uh, I, I believe that I was about 21. I have. There is a wonderful book out where uh, I have a friend of mine who is a great author and she did a whole research on Tinkerbell. And I think it was called The Evolution of a Character. It's a great book. And then she did another one after that. <laughs> She's always upset with me because she will say, if I say, I went to visit Mark Davis the first time and she can, is able to say, it was 11 o'clock in the morning, the rain had stopped a half an hour before, and you were five minutes late. <laughs> you know, I say, it was in the late 40s. <laughs> That's as close as I can get. <laughs>
like Tinkerbell, it's what happened today, that's who I am. Watch the, um, the adventure around the corner, and I'm one of those. Did you ever hear the story about the twins? This was supposed to be a study of why twins, one could be so depressed and one could be so excited with life. Have you ever? Okay, I'll tell you, this is supposed to be, you know, it's, it's not a true story, but it gives you an idea. <clears throat> So they brought these two, these twin boys in, and here in this room over here was manure up to here. And over on this one was manure up to here. And the first boy, one of the twins, they handed him a shovel. The second one, they handed him a shovel. And the first boy said, what? I'm not going to go, what are you talking about shoveling? Up? That's ridiculous. No, no, and he threw the... I'd never heard of it, it goes away. And the other boy says, hey, let me in there. With all that manure, there must be a pony in there someplace. <laughs> and that's Tinkerbell. There must be a pony in there someplace. And we always look for that, and I think Mark Davis saw that in me. And I, people always say, you, each, you turn around, I said, it's a blessing. It's something that I grew up with. And uh, I've loved it ever since. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I don't know how old you were when you did the our gang things, but were you old enough to have memories of that? And did you do anything else at the Howl Road Studios, like Laurel Hardy or anything? No, I remember <coughs> he asked about a Laurel Hardy, whether I worked in that at the Howl Road uh, Studios. No, I did not. I worked at both the Howl Road Studios and MGM when MGM bought <coughs> the whole uh, shebang so from Hal Roach Sr. Now it's Hal Roach Sr., which is very different, who is very different from Hal Roach Jr. But anyway, um, <clears throat> it went from about the age of five to about the age of nine. And we think that I did about eight of them. Because I will tell you, in that time, and I have, uh, I have, if, if anybody's interested in it, come up to my table because I bought some stills. Do you know how hard it is? Well, this is a wonderful business to be in because I will go back to being in our gang comedies. If you walked out of the studio with a still, you would almost be arrested. You were not to have any photographs at all. You couldn't touch them. I mean, it was. It was uh, verboten, right? So I never had any stills of anything that came from there. And years later, I had a friend of mine said, why don't you get yourself over to Eddie Burns' place? I think he's got some stills from you from the Argan comedies. And I went, what? Oh, it couldn't be. That was all. He said, no. MGM was going to throw out every still from our gang, and Eddie Burns bought all of them. And he's open on Saturday from 1 to 3. So I got myself over there, and I'm going, oh, you know, this, there isn't a chance. So I walk in, and huge, about as big as this, with all the stills on tables all the way. And I walked up to him and, and I said, I think you have some stills for me that you're keeping from our gang. He looked at me and he says, Peggy Lynch. That was my name before Eddie Cantor changed my name. Peggy Lynch. I said, how did you know that? He said, your eyes, they haven't changed. Uh -huh. So I went, oh, I got a chance. I got a chance. So he marches over and he picks up about six files of stills. And he said, here they are. And sure enough, there they were. And I said, so how much do I owe? He says, oh no, I want you to have them. Yeah. So they're upstairs or downstairs or around the corner or wherever that place is <laughs> for, you know, like two and a half hours. <laughs> but it's, it's just been, I have some new things that I'm doing. I'm going to put together another book for a voiceover people who never have any product to sell at the vendors. Uh, yeah, all the fun stories. You know, I was in the Andy Griffith show. 
I travel for the Andy Griffith Show. Do you remember Otis Campbell? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Hal Smith and I stood on either side when we did the Three Stooges of the microphone, and we did all these different voices. Let me tell you how you get voices. <laughs> got time? This is fun. I we got time. Okay. I'm standing there on, Hal is looking at me and I'm looking at him, and suddenly uh, I say, Hal, I'm supposed to do a German accent. I, I, I don't remember how to do, I don't think I ever knew how. And he says, you don't know how to do a German accent. You step over here, young woman, and I will show you how. And I said, okay. So over we go in the corner, he says, you have to have a sentence. He said, I have to have a what? A sentence. He says, my sentence for a German accent is, she was looking out the window when I was trying to find her. And sure enough, you used that. I went back and I dropped right into a German accent. And that's how I learned to do that. So a few, you probably don't know this, but <clears throat> if you're doing, see, uh, don't tell anybody I'm doing this because this is politically incorrect nowadays. Will you please not tell anybody? <laughs> I'm not getting any yeses. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, okay. right. So this one, I'm standing there and I'm supposed to do, uh, he's supposed to do a Jewish accent. Well, you, of course he started in, but if you're doing a Jewish accent, you could slide into a southern accent just like that. And you can't get out. You really can't. So he's looking at me and I said, listen, darling, you step over here and I will wait with you. And so I said, what you do is you take and put your voice lay up in the top of your, right, but right there, right under your nose, and you change all the vowels that you can find. And he says, yeah. And I said, and then you use a lot of phlegm. <laughs> <laughs> and he went back and he went back to the Jewish accent. That's what you did. Um, the, the Three Stooges, they never used accents. So, <laughs> can I? I tell a story about it. Please, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm working there, we're doing the Three Stooges. And I was there with uh, 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 Mo Howard and Larry Fine and Joe Dorita. That was the group that I was working with. And I'm all right. There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> 139 episodes and I'm fine. <laughs> anyway. Larry Fine had a speech impediment, and he never heard it. So you start out making an a animated show by recording the track first. That's what you do, and everything is hung on the track kind of thing. So <laughs> we got to the place, and we're rolling just fine, and Larry Fine said, <coughs> had an eye at Oh, Mo, see the ship out there? I think they come to save us. <laughs> and Mo says, Larry, we can't understand the words you said. He says, I'm sorry, Mo. <clears throat> oh, Mo, see the ships out there? I think they've come to save us. Was that better, Mo? <laughs> <laughs> he never heard it. It was, we had to do that every, every once in a while. There were so many wonderful ideas. You know that I was the red-headed mermaid in Peter Pan. Some of you do. That changed my career into voiceover. But I had the line, maybe you remember it, which was, we just wanted to drown her. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now, I'm going to give you a couple of questions, all right? Why do you, and you can look this up, this is an assignment. Why do you suppose that James M. Berry, who wrote the book Peter Pan six, month, six years after the play, which is unusual, you usually write the book first, but it was six years afterwards. Why do you suppose at the play and in the book that he named Tinkerbell Tinker. She fixed them. There were all the different fairies, and that was her job. She fixed everything. She would fix things, she said. What does that mean? You think it would. But why did he 
as a tinker to fix it up. I mean, he could have used almost anything. I'm superior here because I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, you don't have to look it up. There's another one you should look up after this uh, because I'm going to finish begging you to read the unabridged James M. Berry book and I will do one little piece from it so that it will tell you how good it is. It, you will learn more about Tinkerbell and Peter Pan. For example, I'll come back to the Tinkerbell thing in a minute. You know the Lost Boys? You know that there were twins? Do you know that Peter didn't know what twins were? And the twins were not allowed to tell Peter because then they would know more than he would and they had to be kicked out of the Lost Boys. Did you know that? That's the kind of fun stuff that is in his book. It is so rich. I, it's just amazing. So <clears throat> with, with uh, Tinker, James M. Berry was born in Kirrimuir, Scotland uh, and, uh, in the 1800s. I've forgotten which one right now, but you can, you know, take it easy because uh, the play came out in 1904, so let's set him back about 19 or 1870, 60s, right around in there. And every, uh, every once in a while, he would be awakened at his little village with the sound of wooden wheels and a big cart coming in, being pulled by animals. It could be any different kinds. And the tinkers were coming. And the tinkers were also known in other parts of the country as gypsies. And they mended the pots and pans for people first and the other metal things. Well, to us that sounds really strange. What do you mean mended? Well, in that day and age, you could not walk over to Home Depot and say, I need a new skillet. <laughs> if you had a hole in the bottom of your skillet, you didn't eat. As a matter of fact, it was so important, they were often put in wills of who was going to inherit the cooking utensils. So he was, they were very important. They came and they fixed things. Secondly, they fixed other things for people, which I'll not go into because we don't want to know about that. Anyway, so she was given a very important job in 1904. But we don't think of it as important anymore. We just think of it as adorable. <laughs> so she's Tinkerbell. If you read in, in, the, in the book, um, I'll jump to this and then I'll finish up. We're about that time, right? Okay. In the book, there is a last chapter and it's called, Wendy Grows Up. Most people don't even know about it. He put it in the play as a third act and then he wrote the book and added it. And she is in the nursery, and she has her own little girl named Jane. And Peter comes back. He has, he's been away for years. And he comes back because he's going to take Wendy for a week to clean Neverland. And she has to tell Peter, I've grown up. And he starts to sob and to cry. And Nana wakes up, and this wonderful, wonderful scene. I'm not going to tell you how it ends. I really am not, because it will touch your heart. It is just beautiful. So the other part that I want to say to you is, <clears throat> according to James M. Berry's book, this takes place, you see, in the nursery, where Mr. and Mrs. Darling have gone out for dinner. They have left the little night lights on that were glowing beautifully. And suddenly there was another light in the room that flashed about much brighter. And in the time that we have stood to tell you this, they had been in every drawer, this light, and in the pockets of every drawer, looking for Peter Pan's shadow. 
But when this light came to a stop, you realized it was not a light at all. It was made by a little character flashing about. A fairy, a little girl, Tinkerbell, who was clothed in a, a skeletal leaf cut low and square, which showed her figure to best advantage. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out, and make sure to visit Margaret at her booth on the floor. How about one last time for Margaret?